Great. Thank you, Sydney and uh, Guru Focus for inviting me to speak today. It's nice to be back. I was on, I guess it was just over a year ago, talking about European special situations. Uh, as a follow-up to that conversation, I thought it would be useful for your viewers, uh, for me to expand upon something that I mentioned back then, which is investing in family controlled companies. So that's what I'm gonna talk about today. First though, I'm gonna give a quick backstory on who I am and what my firm does. I was incredibly lucky in that I was able to learn from two really incredible people. One was Michael Price, a legendary value investor. And the other was Jan Stenbeck, who was a true visionary in telecom and media and really was a true empire builder. I started in the business back in 1987, working as an intern for Michael Price, who owned a company called Mutual Series Funds, which he eventually sold to Franklin Templeton and that became Franklin Mutual. Everyone in the firm worked for Michael. Every day was a learning day. Watching and listening as he talked about stocks in an open trading room environment. And Michael really ran it as a true meritocracy. He really only respected one thing, which was you were there to make money for the clients, period. Find cheap stocks, understand why they were undervalued and what would change that. And then do it again and again. Over the next 13 years, I went from answering the phones to being his assistant on the trading desk to junior analyst, senior analyst, and portfolio manager. By the time I left the firm, I was managing or co-managing more than half the firm's assets, about $14 billion. And I was head of all European investments across all the funds. That was about seven billion. The methods and lessons that we learned from Michael served as the foundation for Evermore's investment philosophy and process, which is what we built our firm on from the beginning. Early in my career, I realized that there were a lot of public companies, especially outside the United States, that were controlled by an individual or a family. There were families behind companies like AstraZeneca, Ericsson, L'Oreal, Heineken, and so many others. I learned of Jan Stenbeck, who was the largest shareholder in a Sweden-based holding company called Kinevik, or as they would say in Sweden, Kinevik. I, met, I learned of him back in the early 90s when he was disrupting media and telecom. Eventually, the funds that I managed became the largest shareholder after Jan and his family in seven of his public companies in Sweden, as he would create businesses and then partially spin them off to shareholders. When I decided to leave Franklin, Jan suggested that we partner in building a, a new asset management firm together. He seeded the initial fund with $100 million, and we became business partners. From Jan, I learned how companies work from the inside out. As an analyst, you normally only get to see businesses from the outside looking in. He and I really clicked. He was one of the most aggressive and creative business people I have ever met. I learned all about businesses, how they would go into a country and disrupt the telecom sector or break the Swedish government's monopoly on free to air TV. A few years later, unfortunately, Jan died at a very young age, he was 59, at which time I closed the fund and I helped his family build their family office. They didn't have one up until that point. I ended up joining some of their boards and became the chairman of their US holding company, which had operating businesses in a number of sectors. And they also had private equity and venture cap investments as well. So I was very lucky that I got to work for Michael Price and learn how to invest, focusing on how to value a company, understand the triggers to value creation, and working with Jan, learning how businesses really work. I got real operating and restructuring experience. And then in 2009, we founded Evermore Global during the financial crisis. And today we manage several hundred million dollars 
including a 40 act mutual fund and institutional separate accounts for universities and family offices. At the core of our investment philosophy, we are value investors. We focus on special situations, quality companies that we believe are mispriced or undervalued in some way, but importantly, where there are catalysts to crystallize their intrinsic value. We have historically been very concentrated in Europe. And as I said earlier, we place an emphasis on special situations with catalysts. Essentially, we look for investments whose outcomes are less driven by global market movements, but rather a result of company specific events. And catalysts that we look for are primarily operational and financial restructurings, along with management changes, cost cutting programs, asset sales, bank uh, breakups, spinoffs, all kinds of mergers and acquisitions, stock buybacks, and even liquidations. This is investing with triggers. We tend to be hands-on. We like to get to know who is running the company because at the end of the day, we are betting on people. We are not traders, we are investors. Investing in this particular way has real benefits. Over the past three decades, we have cultivated very hard to establish relationships with families and individuals that control businesses across the globe and especially in Europe. All of this leads me to my topic of discussion today, finding value amid family controlled companies around the world. First, I think it's really important for you to understand how we define a family controlled company. And I, I might say family controlled companies during this presentation, I might say FCC uh, as I show you. But basically a family controlled company or FCC is one in which an individual or a family or even two families directly or indirectly control a significant ownership interest, let's say 20% or more of the business. And they can influence the destiny and outcome of the business. They might be the chairman, the CEO, they might be uh, board members, they're involved in a way, but the bottom line is they are involved in a way that means that their DNA is part of how the company thinks and operates. So what is the opportunity that we see in FCCs? This slide really tells an incredible story. This is a chart that was put together by UBS. You can see right here, the red line is an aggregate uh, performance uh, uh, history over the last 15 years of many family controlled businesses globally. Uh, it's sort of taken a whole bunch of these in aggregate. Numerous research reports have been put together and studies, not just by UBS, Credit Suisse, ENY. There's a university in Switzerland. They have a program that only focuses on family control businesses and tracking them and monitoring them and working with them. It's incredible. There's so much data available. And you can, you can kind of get a, it's almost commonsensical that if you have good stewards of capital, it should outperform over time. But what is it that these FCCs do that makes them unique and different? Well, as I talk about here, it's because we believe family control companies are more thoughtful in terms of being allocators of capital when making staffing decisions about projects they choose to undertake, uh, how they handle management transitions, how generational transitions impact the business when they shift from generation to generation to generation, and overall, regarding their longer term outlook for tomorrow and beyond, what are the right capital decisions that you make today to compound well into the future? This way of thinking is not the typical way that public companies think. Most public companies are focused on what can we do now so that this quarter is a good number, as opposed to what can we do now so that we have years of growth and potential opportunity uh, well into the future. And so there's this huge uh, disconnect between how these family control businesses think versus let's say your average public company where they're thinking more short term. And when you think about it, in aggregate, these traits lead to higher profitability, which is what ultimately drives stock performance. Some of the greatest businesses in the world are controlled by families and they are investing for long-term value creation for themselves 
and their shareholders. And we want to invest alongside them. So family controlled companies are often complex entities. They are typically conglomerates or holding companies with diverse business operating uh, businesses operating in multiple markets globally. In our view, some of the most overlooked public companies in the world are conglomerates controlled by families, many with impressive track records spanning decades or even centuries. And I'll talk about one or two of those as well. And yet from time to time, some of these may trade at sizable discounts to the sum of their holdings, the sum of their parts. While the discount to the sum of the parts might attract us to a specific case, it's really the long-term compounding that really drives us. If over time the discount shrinks, that's a bonus on top of the compounding effect. In order to determine which of these companies are worthy of an investment, we must do extensive work to vet the track record and the history of the main shareholders, as well as analyze the underlying businesses. Family controlled companies tend to have many of the specific traits that we look for as a special situations investor. Uh, for example, there may be a dynamic value creator at the helm of the business. And that's really what we're looking for. Who are they? What do they bring to the table? What skill sets have they demonstrated to create shareholder value? It's all about the people. And therefore, it's critically important to identify the value creators that evolve, aggressively transform their operations, and are extremely opportunistic with their strategic decisions regarding all kinds of things like acquisitions, asset sales, and just everything related to capital allocation for the business. Ultimately, we are investing in jockeys, not just horses. If you think about it, the, if this was a horse race, ultimately the horse doesn't really know what to do. It needs the right jockey. But at the same time, the jockey needs the right horse. It's a symbiotic relationship. So in business terms, you need the right people and you need the right assets or businesses. Together, it's very powerful. Investors can benefit by seeking to partner with these FCCs by owning their stock that have built incredibly powerful compounding businesses and are typically very focused on maximizing profitability over the long term. And so finding, really finding good stewards of capital, it's just so important. Many of these family controlled companies are just not of interest to us, especially if they tend to favor their own interests as the biggest beneficiary at the expense of the shareholders. Or if the family is more focused on collecting dividends and not really leading the company to growth and solid returns. We want something more than just a dividend stream. We'll invest in a family controlled company that show where they showcase a true owner's mentality. The focus is really on creating value and where we and the and where they and the, us as the shareholders are truly aligned. If you look at the bottom of my slide here, it says invest like owners. That's our tagline. It, it means a lot. We really take this to heart. We want to think as though we're the owner of the business. And when you think in those terms, it helps you avoid a lot of mistakes. You know, think about it. You, you have to ask yourself, if I could own the whole business, would I want to? And if you say, why would I want to own that business? But I'm okay owning a few shares. It makes no sense. You want businesses where you'd love to own the whole thing if you could. And so that's how we think about it. Of course, we're not buying the whole company, but we want to think in those terms. Or we ask, is the leader of this group or the management team or the family behind it, are they destroying value or creating value? Do they have an owner's mentality? What have they learned from the prior generations that were running the businesses? Do they have a succession plan in place that's well thought out? What's the corporate governance, if they have any? And corporate governance is key. We've seen some companies where the next generation basically cannot run the business. They're not, 
they, they build it into the charter of the business. They could have board seats. They could be still large shareholders, but they start to bring in professional managers because they determine they don't want to be beholden to their niece or their nephew or whoever's the next generation. Others have incredible succession plans for business operators and they're training them and they're grooming them and they're indoctrinating them for many, many years to bring them in. Everyone's different. We want to understand what the nuance is for each and every case and how we think it might impact the ultimate value over time. Earlier, I said we, we ask if this is a leader that is a value creator or a value destroyer. Well, you might think, why would I want to meet with value destroyers? You're going to learn more from value destroyers than you're going to learn from value creators because you're learning what to avoid. It's like getting the map to the minefield. You're learning what to avoid and stay away from because it's, it's, it's interesting that most value destroyers don't think of themselves as value destroyers. They think they're value creators. Maybe somebody inherits a company that's a 5 billion market cap. Uh, two years later, it's a 3 billion. That guy says, or gal says, uh, you know, I'm still rich. Uh, we control half the company, whatever. Meanwhile, their decisions are just crushing the shareholders' returns and eating up valuable uh, resources of the business. And it's worth less and less and less and less, yet they think they're value creators. So you want to meet them. You want to see what kind of decision-making they make. And you just take as many notes as you can. So you say, these are the things that I will stay away from. And you just make a list of those. And you just, you have to have your rules of thumb where you say, those are the kinds of things I'm just not going to do it. You have to be diligent on that and not get suckered in because it's a good story if the numbers don't back it up. Um, so that is a key piece. As I say, the value destroyers learn so much. Uh, you can learn so much from them. Um, here I just touch on a variety of things that fall into the special situations uh, category. I'm not going to take you through it, but the fact is I've touched on some of these throughout the conversation so far. So getting back to what investors should look for, it's really about, and I've said it a few times already, compounding machines. Do they have this alignment of incentives between management's long-term strategy and the family's core values? Our analysis has shown that this alignment often leads to superior compounding and risk return characteristics, especially by those companies that are innovative, adaptable, and quality focused. So you might be thinking at this point, great, David, you're talking about a lot of different things, but can you give us some examples? Well, the good news is I can, I'm gonna do that now. Uh, so, I'm going to just touch on a variety of these. Here I talk about how these types of businesses have uh, something in their DNA. It's this shared DNA across all of these types. It's really value creation. They're wired a certain way. Uh, and that's why so many of them are multi-generational. They've lived through all kinds of cycles and problems and good times and tough times. The best family control companies are opportunistic in their business building initiatives and tend to fall into one of these categories that I list out here. And I'll touch on a couple of them. So for example, uh, where I call it classic compounders, I have a company called Exor. My guess is you may not have ever heard of Exor. I promise you, you know of their products. I'm gonna just jump ahead here. Exor controls The Economist magazine, Juventus, if you're into so uh, soccer, you know Juventus. Um, they recently bought 24% of Louboutin, uh, when, uh, women's shoes and accessories. It's notable they have the red soles at the bottom, very famous and high growth, very expensive products. CNH, which is industrial uh, businesses, backhoes, all kinds of equipment, heavy equipment. And then, of course, a little company you may have heard of called Ferrari. Um, which they now still own 23% of. Uh, and then Stellantis. You may not have heard of Stellantis, but you know their products. They control Jeep, Chrysler, Fiat, uh, Maserati, Alfa Romeo. They recently merged with Peugeot. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's an incredible group of assets that they have. So what makes this company special and why is this one of these compounders? Well, the head of the family, so this is the, this legendary famous family in Italy, the Agnelli family. Uh, the head of the family today is a guy named John Elkin. Uh, John is in his mid-40s. 
when he was in his early 20s, his grandfather said, okay, you're the guy. Basically, you're going to take over one day. And the grandfather trained him, brought him to meetings, introduced him all over the world, and really groomed, helped John be groomed to one day run the family's group, the empire that the family had had uh, built. When he was about 28, his grandfather died. He became the chairman of the group. One of the great things, and we've gotten to know him over the years, one of the great things that he's done, one of the many great things he's done, is he really was very good at finding very talented people, bringing them in, and then unleashing them to their skill set. Not saying he had all the answers, but he wanted to have as many answers as he could have, but then have these people on his team who are just incredible as well, building this powerhouse of, of brain power and thought and creativity. One of those people was Sergio Marchionne. Well, during the financial crisis back in 08, 09, uh, Exor had this great idea. Let's buy Chrysler from the US government. It was a bankruptcy. It was being bailed out. Uh, they were about to, they were debating should they shut the business down or what? They bought it from the US government. They paid a very modest price. And then they transformed Jeep into truly a global brand. I mean, if you go to these all kinds of de derivatives of the, of the Jeep, and they're not cheap anymore. And so in any case, they transformed Jeep and Chrysler, and it became the cornerstone of the cash flow generation of the group. Uh, they eventually, uh, and all kinds of things that he would do here. I'm not going to get bogged down too much on, on an individual case here, but at some point they determined we should IPO Ferrari. Uh, well, they convinced the world it was not a car company. It's a luxury brand, and they got a luxury brand multiple. It's been incredible uh, uh, stock as a public company. Uh, last year, Stellantis merged, uh, it was Fiat Chrysler was the name, merged with Peugeot uh, in France, creating a powerhouse global group of brands, and they renamed the company Stellantis. They have a smaller stake now, 14%, but it's a smaller stake of a much larger group. And as they've taken cash out of the businesses over the years, they've used it for other investments like the soccer team, uh, like Louboutin. A few years ago, they bought Partner Re, uh, a large insurance business. Uh, they recently announced that they're selling that business. They got an incredible price for it. They're going to get over 9 billion euros. That deal will close this summer. They'll have net cash. They've already announced a big stock buyback. So John is sort of always, I'll say, reinventing himself. When he took over the family business, it was really in sad shape. Today, this is a vibrant group of businesses. You, As I note here at the top of the page, he's compounded, even with the market sell-off, since he's the chairman, 17 years now, they've compounded their net asset value at about 20% a year over the years. It's incredible compounding. I'm going to press on and, instead of getting bogged down in any individual name. Next, I want to talk about Bolleray Group. Bolloré is a 200-year-old French company. It's currently run by the sixth generation of the family, Vincent Bolloré. Uh, he's turning 70 this year. Uh, I started meeting with him back in the 90s, before he was a billionaire, when he was transforming the family's old business that was in, they owned palm oil, rubber plantations. They had businesses that made thin paper for um, cigarettes and uh, even the, the, the thin paper that's in Bibles, they made those very skinny, almost see-through pages. Uh, in any case, they turned that into an industrial powerhouse. And so over the years, they became the largest owner of ports in Africa, transportation and logistics businesses around the world, especially in Africa, but also in Europe. Uh, and Vincent Bolloré really became an incredible value investor on his own. Some might call him a corporate raider even though it's a family controlled conglomerate, he'd go after other businesses, find the fulcrum security and take control, clean those businesses up. One of the businesses that he went after aggressively is also on my page. It's called Vivendi. That's on the lower uh, line there. Vivendi is a telecom and media powerhouse. And Vivendi in turn, uh, when they took a big stake in it, also had an incredible gem inside called Universal Music Group, the largest music company in the world. Today, they rep everybody from Taylor Swift, Rolling Stones, and have one of the greatest catalogs going back over 100 years. And 
last year, I think it was last year, they spun off uh, Universal Music to shareholders. Vivendi kept 10%. And uh, when they did the spinoff, because Bolloray is the biggest shareholder in Vivendi, they got a big chunk of that dividend or distribution. So they effectively are still the largest direct and indirect shareholder and control universal music. So in any case, you have Bolloray also recently announced some big asset sales. They're selling all their African ports. They've decided it's time to move on from the ports. That deal will close this summer. They too will have net cash on the balance sheet. So these companies have incredible firepower to continue their process of buying interesting assets that will be very durable and long-term generators of capital. Sometimes they'll sell them. Sometimes they'll keep them really forever. It depends on the situation. Lifco under M&A uh, uh, family control companies, company you've probably never heard of. This is a Sweden-based conglomerate. They've made well north of 100 acquisitions in the last decade. Uh, one guy controls the company, Carl Bennett. Uh, he IPO'd it about six years ago. This stock is up 12 times from the IPO. Uh, it's a powerhouse of rolling up small and mid-sized businesses, everything from dental equipment to robotics for demolition for buildings and so forth. A lot of the businesses that he targets and his team targets are family controlled businesses. They're not looking to, they're like, I, I hate to say somebody's a mini something, but they're like a mini Berkshire Hathaway in the sense that they never sell. He buys with the idea that we're keeping them forever. And so uh, he IPO'd about half the company. Uh, I think it's about a $10 billion market cap. So, and he still owns about uh, roughly half of it. Uh, and as I say, this has been a compounding machine since the IPO. And when it was a private company, it was just compounding its, its equity as well just incredibly good capital allocators and thoughtful. They don't look for turnarounds. They don't look for transformations. They want good businesses at attractive prices. Uh, these guys are not just value investors, they're cheapos. I mean, you go to their headquarters and you would actually think that they just moved in. They've been there for 20 years. It's nothing on the walls. The coffee machine looks like he picked it up at a yard sale. I mean, he's one of the richest guys in Sweden and you, he just looks like a normal guy who's just trying to get ahead today. And yet he's got this empire he's built. He has other public companies as well in his group. So in any case, that company IPO'd in 2014. So it's, it's, uh, it's about eight years now. Um, and it's just been, uh, like I say, an incredible uh, ride for its shareholders and can live well beyond him. But he's in his 60s. He's, he's not an old guy. Next, we have what we call asset management uh, type businesses. Everybody's heard of KKR. So for us, we, we learned long ago you don't really need to be in their funds. You want to own the funds. You want to own the asset management business. And so KKR falls into a family control company uh, presentation because the founders and the insiders of the company continue to own a remarkable percentage of the public company, over 40%. Kravis and Roberts have recently sort of started their process of exiting. They're really, I mean, I'm sure they're, they're always chiming in, but there's a succession plan that was well vetted and well laid out. Uh, they pay out one of the smallest dividends of any publicly traded private equity group simply because they want to keep recycling the cash into their deals rather than pay, uh, paying it out to the shareholders where it just goes away. So they're very good at, at capital allocation and recycling. Uh, and since it's been a public company, again, it's been a great compounder. Uh, I have two others that I showcase here. One is called Eurasio. Uh, the family that's behind the Lazard group was the original founders here. Um, their patriarch, who's I think 100 years old now, Michelle David Vey, is the chairman emeritus. He's transitioning. Uh, but you have another family that's taken a big stake, J.C. Duco, which is one of the largest billboard operators in the world, another French family. Uh, and so they, same thing, we want to be, when you think about businesses like that, you want to own the asset management business as a shareholder. They're just great compounders over the long term. And then Onyx, that's a Canadian firm that was started by a guy named Jerry Schwartz, uh, who's still below, I think the, he and members of his investment team are the largest owners. Um, same thing, you want to own that. That's one of the cheaper ones as well, as it continues to get more transparent in how they talk to the market. 
and investors, we think it'll continue to be revalued. It's just very undervalued. But all three of these are compounding machines over time. Uh, pressing on, um, sometimes family control companies could be restructuring cases. Uh, Hapag Lloyd is a great example. Uh, you might have, uh, you might see some, you might be on the highway and you see a truck passing by you, it says Hapag Lloyd on the side. So Hapag Lloyd is one of the largest transportation, logistics, and containership businesses in the world. Um, they IPO'd a number of years ago. Um, they were really forced because they had a shareholder that owned 25%. For some reason, a travel company in Germany had 25% of the business and had the right to push them to IPO themselves. They pushed it. It was when shipping was very out of favor. Um, eventually, there's uh, a large shipping uh, and logistics business, a family uh, uh, group in Germany that evolved as one of the largest holders here. What we did when they announced their IPO was looming. We spent a lot of time with management. Uh, we spent a lot of time getting to know the business, the CEO and how they were gonna do things. And we thought, okay, this CEO is maybe one of the most underrated guys that we've ever met. Uh, he inherited a bad balance sheet. He inherited a business that was not streamlined, but he had a real plan of attack and we challenged him very aggressively. And he, you know, it's the kind of thing where you say, I'll believe it when I see it. But the reality is when you start to see it, you have to start to believe it. And he was delivering and the market didn't care. So they came to the market at 20 euros a share. Uh, within six months, it was 14. Let's fast forward. Today, it's 420. And by the way, before the IPO for a whole year, they started at trying to get it IPO'd at a much higher level. They just kept cutting the price, cutting the price. No interest out there. So as I say, IPO at, at 20, falls to 14 within six months. Today, it's about 420 euros per share. Business is booming. Now, there's an element of the environment. These are businesses tied to, this type of business is tied to the global economy. And over the last X number of years, shipping companies, because of a lot of regulatory changes, fuel, fuel emission issues, and all kinds of things that were going on, just stopped ordering a lot of new ships. Because in the prior cycle, they all ordered too many ships. So you had a glut of capacity and you didn't have enough demand. Eventually that turned where you didn't have enough capacity and demand started growing, especially as the pandemic started to fade. Uh, and so companies like Hapag Lloyd are making, they reported numbers, I think earlier, it wasn't this week, it was late last week, record numbers, quarter after quarter after quarter after quarter. And the I think the market cap uh, at the IPO was like 5 billion euros. It's like 70 billion today. It's only a few years later. And so, uh, but along the way, the CEO said, you know what, we aren't going to just fix our company. We're going to grow aggressively. So he merged with the largest player in Chile. And then after they consolidated that business, that's called CSAV. Then he said, okay, we can, we can eat more. We're still hungry and we can absorb it well. And then they bought the largest or merged with the largest player in Egypt. So shipping is kind of a quirky business in that it almost doesn't matter where you're headquartered. These are global businesses. But we think of these as, as European companies. Hapag Lloyd is, is, I think it's headquartered in Hamburg, Germany at the port. Uh, in any case, same CEO today. He's done really an incredible job. I consider him one of the best CEOs that we've met uh, uh, for me in my, in my whole career. Um, they've integrated, they've cut costs, classic textbook case of how you transform, how you clean up, how you restructure. And with that main shareholder, Mr. Kuna, who's the main shareholder here behind them, it's sort of, they have the DNA and the tenor and the tempo to sort of not stretch, uh, even though in my view, they, they stretched in a smart way and they've been successful all the way through. Pressing on, the one to the right of that is a company called Zim. Zim is another container ship company. This one's an Israel-based business. It's actually controlled by Edan Ofer. Who is he? He's the richest man in Israel. Uh, so through a series of his holding companies that trade uh, in the New York, uh, on the New York Stock Exchange, Zim was IPO'd in January of 21. So it's only a public company, in, uh, barely 18 months. 
17 or 18 months, whatever it is now. I'll cut to the chase here. The bottom line is Zen for 70 years was a was what we call a tomorrow story. It was always going to work tomorrow. They just always had issues, there were problems, it went through a variety of changes of ownership. Finally, it went to this one group, and he and his family really started to think it through. And in 2017, they brought in a new management team. And the leader of that management team, uh, a guy named Ellie Glickman, came in. And while it's going to sound crazy, he basically said, well, I, I know we're a shipping company, but why do we need to own any ships? And so they sold all the ships. And then they would charter them back or charter other ships and built a fleet of what we call an asset light shipping company. They don't own the ships, but they have multi-year license um, uh, contracts so that they can, they run them, they operate them, they do all the work, but somebody else owns them. So they're not taking that asset uh, risk and that balance. It's, they take a different type of a balance sheet risk. In any case, they got rid of the ships. They became really a high tech business. They transformed to really how shipping is done. You know, you run the ship one degree this way instead of that way, you save this much fuel, all kinds of things that they do. And their technology has been evolving and developed so well over the years. And effectively, so let's let's bottom line it. They IPO'd it at $15 per share in January, on January 26, 2021. Uh, within one day, it was trading at 11.50 a share. It collapsed right out of the gate. Um, well, it's almost 18 months later. The stock, I don't know where it is today, 60 something dollars per share. Uh, but they've also paid seven, what did they pay? They just paid a $17 dividend uh, at the beginning of April and they paid 450 before that. So since the IPO came, we've received on a $15 IPO, they have already paid in the first 18 months, 2150 in dividends. Today, they announced another quarter of record earnings just this morning. And they announced an, uh, their dividend for this quarter will be $2.85 per share. So even though it's an Israeli company, it trades here in the US on the New York Stock Exchange uh, under the symbol Zim, their name. And uh, so they have net cash now. Shipping companies generally never have net cash. To optimize it, you you want debt. You want to take loans out against your assets. More recently, Zim has been acquiring some ships. It's a much smaller group of ships than they had in the past. It's just that they want more capacity because their view is the opportunity. You see it every day in the news, the backup at the ports, the supply chain issues, all of that. It's a boon for these kinds of shipping businesses. Investors don't always think about, yes, those kinds of things are bad news for certain companies. They're great news for other companies. So you, you have to understand who does it hurt, but who does it help? So in any case, both Zim and Hapag Lloyd are uh, net cash businesses today, which we never would have expected uh, even just six to nine months ago. And we think it actually Zim is still a very uh, compelling uh, situation. If you look at the multiples, it's, it's ridiculously cheap. Um, I'll give one more stock that I'll talk about. It's in the spinoff category. Um, it's called IAC, uh, IAC Interactive Corp. Here we go. I have another slide here. IAC was created by Barry Diller, legendary media mogul. Uh, Diller created this um, really back in the mid 90s where he bought these old UHF TV channels and sort of it kind of evolved into what became uh, or ended up owning QVC and Home Shopping Network. Why are they a compound? Well, first of all, Diller and the CEO, Joey Levin, control this uh, enough stock to be sort of the, the controlling group. Uh, Diller has enough. We view this as a family control company because of his ownership. Um, so what they do, it's really impressive. They buy businesses. They invest in them, they scale them up, they nurture them over the years, and then eventually they bring them back to the market. Here, I highlight a couple of them. You've heard of TripAdvisor. They did it with TripAdvisor, Expedia, Home Shopping, uh, Ticketmaster, today called Live Nation, uh, and uh, Match.com. So in the late 90s, they bought Match, 
It's a tiny business. Uh, they invested, nurtured, spent the money needed to really grow it, acquired some others along the way, dating apps and other things related. And uh, just a couple of years ago, they decided that if they listed Match, so it IPO'd, and at some point, the value of Match's market cap of the shares they owned, I think they had about 85% at one point, was worth more than the whole value of IAC. So just to make up some numbers, imagine IAC was trading at $100 a share, but they had $105 a share of just Match. And then when you looked at their other businesses, you were getting all their other businesses for like a negative cost, literally for free. Uh, and so eventually they peeled off match, gave it to the shareholders. Then a year late, a little more than a year later, they, they did the same with Vimeo. Vimeo hasn't fared as well in the market. We look at, at IAC as though, I think of Diller and Joey Levin as almost like magicians. If you think of the magician's hat, and the magician can pull rabbits out of the hat. To me, this is like a business where there's an unlimited amount of rabbits in this hat. So we don't need to own the rabbits. We like to own the hat. And so over the years, we if we've received distributions, we've probably sold them and moved on. We've, you want to keep the hat. You want to keep the, the, the machine at the top, the compounding machine. Um, they today own 85% of Angie's List. They own 100% of Care.com. But the biggest acquisition they've made to date is shown on the bottom left here. It's called Dot Dash Meredith. Meredith is the old print business of uh, Meredith Corp, which was People Magazine, Better Homes and Gardens, um, Southern Living, all kinds of magazines, tons of, of titles. Meredith was really good uh, running their print subscription business. They're probably not the best at optimizing a digital business. So IAC bought it and they're doing the same thing. Nurture, invest in, transform, grow. Eventually this division probably comes back to market in the next couple of years. Uh, they've already had a couple of quarters. They only closed this deal last year where they've had some numbers come out. The early, the early look is very positive for what's been coming out uh, of this unit. It just was so, in our view, so undermanaged that just the beginnings of the tweaks are unleashing a lot, unleashing a lot of value. They also put a chunk of capital into MGM, uh, the casino business, really right, right at the depths of the pandemic. Took a couple of board seats, uh, the value, which was an unusual investment for them because normally they're buying things much earlier in their life cycle. MGM was really viewed as a company where, at least from our perspective maybe didn't optimize the way they run their loyalty programs. Um, and IAC is really exceptionally talented in, in really how you monetize and optimize technology and social media and e-commerce businesses, all of these things together, they have just a, such an incredible track record of doing. Uh, that stock has more than doubled since they took their stake. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of opportunity around MGM uh, going forward. So we view this as uh, still the, the magician's hat with a lot of vibrant assets inside it. Uh, they're talking about IPO in Turo, which is a car sharing service uh, where you can rent, you can literally rent somebody else's car for the day or whatever. Uh, they own about 25% of that business. So there's a lot happening over the, the next, uh, just like over the last years, it's sort of, it's, I don't wanna call it boom and bust, but it's sort of investing and harvesting. There are periods where they're investing and then there's and growing and nurturing. And then there's periods of harvesting when they're spinning them off and getting, or at least uh, doing the IPO and kickstarting that, that crystallization of value. And to top it all off, they have net cash on the balance sheet. So they have an incredible war chest of a billion and a half plus dollars to, to do continue to do this kind of thing. So, I guess at this point, I, I know I could keep talking for hours, but I'm going to, um, just before I open it up for any Q&A, um, maybe I'll just give a quick sort of sum, summary comment. It's really that the, we're seeing it today in the markets. It's crazy out there. The global business climate over the next few years will, in our view, be unlike any period that investors have witnessed in decades. 
there's so much disruption and so many businesses are going through change. And so we believe that the goal, there's been so much stimulus money spent. The global stimulus packages, coupled with the explosion of American style entrepreneurs around the world, along with family controlled businesses and aggressive corporate leadership teams will be a real driving force behind significant value creation for investors in the years ahead. It's, look, family controlled businesses, as we've, we've talked about some here, there are others out there. In the long run, they have proven themselves worthy of, of surviving through all kinds of storms, crisis periods, good times, tough times, bad times, devastation. The best ones have gone through it and have the experience. They're battle hardened. So family control businesses that should do well, regardless of macro inputs, they'll benefit from the, the underpinning of these transformative and unprecedented plans and spending and their strong balance sheets where they can take advantage of more opportunities when others are not doing so. So we think that many of these are positioned to deliver really exceptional results over time. And if you think about it, between interest rates up, supply chain issues, commodity prices, just with all of the stuff that's on the plate now for investors to think about and for companies to think about, we really believe that more than ever, this is just a great time to focus more on who are the stewards of your capital, especially, as I've said, these types that have seen it before and they have learned from their predecessors and for themselves living uh, through these crisis periods. So that's why we think family control companies are a worthwhile consideration when you think about how, how to allocate your capital in your portfolio. Okay, any questions? All right, um, I know I had one uh, specifically in regard to like how you, uh, you mentioned, you know, like getting to, to learn more about the, the families that, you know, are behind these companies and such, like how do you go about doing that? Cause you know, you may not necessarily find a lot of information if you Google it, um, but, so like kind of tell us your process in that. Sure. Um, it's, it's a lot easier than it was back in the olden days when I started doing this, because while it may not be available that easily on Google, there are, um, there, there's a lot of information out there that you can find. As I, as I said at the beginning, you know, just even searching for just, just a generic search on family controlled companies. Uh, let's say you did family con control companies in Asia, family control companies in the US, family control companies in Europe. You might just get a list, but now you do, you do, you dig into who they are, who are the players. We go to their websites. Exor for many years, the family themselves were, were fascinated and they still are by other family control businesses. And on their website, they were publishing all kinds of data they were getting. Sadly, I don't think it's on their website anymore. But the point is, there is a lot, and I referenced some of these presentations um, that have been put together um, by Credit Suisse or UBS or whoever, but the fact is you can search for these companies um, and you can find interviews more than ever before, histories, compendiums. Uh, there's all kinds of books written on, on, it may not be on the group of families, but it might be on that particular family and how they built L'Oreal or whatever. The best, quite frankly, is when they've had issues. If there's been a family fight and they broke it into two public companies, because then you have more articles, more stories, more history. And because they are public companies, there's just more information than before. So if you just search, we do keyword searches. We don't really screen on numbers. We key on keywords. Uh, we used to do things like a patriarch, plus died, plus holding company, you'd get all kinds of Asian conglomerates transitioning. Now you're also getting German mid-sized companies where the next generation actually doesn't want to own the business. They want to sell it. So you're seeing a lot of transactions happening. But it's doing that. And for us, we've been able to navigate and try to get to meet them. And some of them you're never going to meet. Um, but they have done enough interviews like Barry Diller's out there all the time talking. You can find so much information on some of these guys. Um, and, but it is harder when you get further away from 
of the US. But once you start digging, you find that you find more, it's like the tip of the iceberg. So at the beginning, you just see a little bit, but the more you dig, actually, the more you can find. So I would tell you, you actually probably can start with Google, mm -hmm. but then you kind of have to keep flaring out from there because you'll see profiles of, there's one group in Sweden, uh, we realized the family put together a website, literally just talking about the family's rules for succession, corporate governance, their generation, I think they're shifting to the sixth or seventh generation of their family. And they've decided to let the world know uh, that's the Wallenberg family. And so if you go to wallenberg.com, they have a whole website. I don't think a lot of people go look at the website. It's phenomenal because they actually are telling you what they think and how they think about it. And so if you want, you could then go look at their public company, which is called Investor, like the word investor. It's trades in Sweden. Uh, but the fact is you can just, they control Ericsson, AstraZeneca, uh, all kinds of big companies there. And uh, people just haven't even focused on it. So the info's out there. It's just you got to do the homework. You got to dig. Interesting. Sure. Um, it looks like Abel has a question. Do you see that there on the chat? I wait. I'm not sure. I do. Wait. I'll figure it out here. Oh, it may be on the live. You need to go to live chat. Oh, Abel. Yeah. Abel from Dublin. Yes. But I see. This is high. This is Abel, but I don't see what the question. Is. Oh, okay. It says, um, I can read to you. So. Since you seem to own several European stocks, do you know of any good resources for researching European companies, um, kind of like a European equivalent of like Guru Focus, for instance? Oh, that's a, that's a great one. Um, so maybe Guru Focus should expand to include more European stocks. Uh, uh, <laughs> but um, Europe, but yeah, it's no, I know. I, I, <laughs> it's, a, it's a start. It, it definitely is. I would say that there's really no sort of just simple uh, resource. It's 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 really unfortunately, if it was that easy, we wouldn't find opportunities. They wouldn't be so compelling. Um, but as I say, if you just start by searching for pick, pick, you know, when you think about, it's almost like when you think about a company and hear about a company, who owns it, who controls it, who's the main shareholder. Start asking that question, and you start to realize more often than not, especially in Europe, there's Big, who's the main owner behind it? And then start reading about them. Um, and it just requires a lot more effort. effort. So I would say to, to Abel, it, you just got to, you, you have to dig. You know, people ask Warren Buffett, you know, how can I do it? And he's like, well, start, start with the A's and work your way to the Z's. I mean, just like read everything. I've gone to the meeting for like 20 years that somebody always asks him a good question, how you can do it. I don't think you have to start at the A's and go to the Z's for, for what I'm talking about with family controlled companies. Start with, um, look at just keywords like multi-generational public companies. You're going to start seeing things. And then it just gives you, you could pick out the ones that are in Europe or in Asia, whatever is of interest to you, go to their website. What you find is that the more you dig, the more you find. And a lot of these webs, so here's the trick that I like to do. I'll go to their website and I'll say, okay, how far back can I print out? For, forget the financials for a minute. You're trying to learn who these people are. I'll print out 15 or 20 years of the section of the annual report that's the chairman's letter or some sort of an overview of the CEO. A lot of European companies will have a chairman and a CEO letter. And I'll take them, I'll, stat, I'll print them out, old, old fashioned way. I invented binge reading, okay? So a long time ago, I take this stack, turn it upside down, I just sit there and I read all of these letters and it's, it's like a, it's like a movie because you're binging it in one shot and you see, Oh, 18 years ago, they had an initiative to do that today. That's their biggest business or that family did something. They invested 50 million, but somehow they just wrote off, wrote off a billion. They got it wrong. And so you learn so much about the company, but you can also learn who the players are. And as you see the key players in the company and how they speak, and how they talk about their family's involvement. Um, you know, there's a, there's a company in Belgium called Ackermans. It's a 114 year old company. It does not trade here in the U.S. I don't even think there's an ADR. But if you go to the Ackermans website, it's just a great website for how they think about being stewards of capital 
for their shareholders and their family, which they've been for generations now. And over time, we've gotten to know them. They're just so good at what they uh, do. So. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Um, let's see. I don't know. There's another question from David Yazdan. It says, uh, if you are able to get a meeting with a family who controls businesses, like how, how do you do that? How do you go about doing that? Usually, is it just by chance or meeting the right people? That's uh, one of our uh, tricks of the trade. But yeah. uh, no, I'll tell you how we do it. Um, you have to work your way in. You have to. So what I have done, and it doesn't always work, but I will reach out to the company, try to get to know them with some questions. Uh, I will ask for a, uh, can I meet with the main shareholder? What I do when I meet even, let's say it's the CEO or the CFO or somebody else at the company, I actually, they always want to go right into pitch mode. I, I say, you know, I read your presentation. What I'd like to do is understand who you are and what your story is and why did you want to even be part of this business if they're not from the family? Or how did you evolve? I remember meeting one group in, in Spain. The guy's grandfather had built this thing, this business, this conglomerate after World War II. I said, can you tell me, tell me your family's history and how this all evolved? He's like, I didn't do anything. My grandfather did that. I'm like, well, your grandfather did this with the business. Your father did this. You did this. And I said, I would just love to hear your story. And what you find is that very successful people love to tell their story once you can get them to tell, talk. And you just learn without ever asking him about his company. I learned all about his company, why he hates regulated businesses, how difficult certain businesses are in Spain, which CEOs used to work for him now running other companies. And I can learn so much by just talking and then being a good listener. It is very hard to get in with these groups. Sometimes I just simply go the simplest route of all. I send a letter and I ask for a meeting, but I showcase to them that I know their business. I've spent a lot of time getting to know it and I would love to meet with so-and-so. And many times you're not gonna get the meeting right away. You still have to go through some channels but by putting the effort in, you can get those meetings and you can learn so much by doing your homework. And uh, it's, and by the way, they, when you get in the door, you finally realize that in a lot of cases, we've turned a meeting into a relationship that's evolved over years because we can offer something in return. What is that? When you get outside the US, people will always ask us, so, you know, they're, everybody's intrigued by America, just like we're intrigued by their country. And so uh, they'll ask, well, what is it really like under, right now it would be Biden, before that it was Trump, before that it was Obama, whatever. Uh, but I will say, sometimes people say, well, so what's, uh, what's Biden really like? As though we're hanging out with each other. And so the reality is it's not, this is not a big country. I mean, this is a huge country. And so we're, no, we don't hang out with, with the leadership of the country. Uh, but um, uh, in any case, it's, it's offering something in return when they, when you're asked, well, how is stimulus impacting you in America and just being thoughtful and, and be, and just sort of have a give and take. And I find that's how you develop a relationship. That guy that I mentioned in Spain, that was one of the hardest meetings that I was ever, that it, it took me more than a year to get it. But after I got him talking about himself, when he was finally in New York, he sent me a fax and he said, not an email. I couldn't believe our fax machine actually still worked. He said, I'm going to be in New York. Can we share a cup of coffee if you'd like? And I'm like, this guy's a billionaire. I have to share a cup of coffee with him. I'm, I'm kidding, but that's the way he wrote it. And it was great because I had connected to a level where we now had a dialogue. And to this day, when I go back to Spain on a trip, I will seek him out. He's in his seventies now. He's just, he knows all the players and all the public companies. And it's just a good chat, picking his, his, his brain and getting thoughts. We just have a, we share I, is what I'm learning is what he's learning. I tried to turn it into a real connection. I mean, I, I I don't want to keep blabbering here, but I'll say when I talked about my backstory, I talked about working for a guy named Michael Price. One of the great lessons I got from Michael was when I asked him to call somebody in his network when I was looking at a stock, he's like, yeah, that guy's in my network. You have to build your own network. 
And really, he said that to me more than once. And I realized I do need to build my own network. And I do the same with my team. And we have a collective sharing of the network. If I have a network and you have a network and three other people have a network, the knowledge, you're not looking for secrets. You're not looking for any of that. I'm trying to understand how people think, how they think about creating value, if they even think about it, how they run their businesses. But you just have to put the homework in. And there's a huge leverage effect when multiple people in a group have the network, uh, in their own networks, and you start sharing. And even better, you share people across your network, two different families are looking at a different you hear that guy or gal saying they're selling a division of their private company. And you know, that family is looking to buy those things. You connect them. We're not even trying to, you're not trying to make a buck out of it. You just, you, you just connect people if you can. And so in any case, I, I feel like I'm just kind of going off on a tangent here, but it's a, it requires a lot of, you have to work at it to put the effort in, but if you do it and you read about these groups you know what, over time, you develop such a knowledge base of so many different kinds of businesses. Um, the last thing I'll say on that, on networking and, and families, is that in 20, up until 2015, we had never looked at a shipping company. Just never looked at one. The whole industry was in sheer devastation. And so we decided, well, they can't all go out of business. Goods need to be moved around the world. Let's put a little effort into shipping. And we, it's one of the most over-conferenced industries. There was always a conference. And we went to a shipping conference and we thought we were at a funeral. It was so sad. The bankers were basically in tears. The families, like shipping is a business dominated by families, multi-generational. And we realized, I, I looked around the room and we said, do you, do, you, do you smell it? Opportunity. And it was that they can't all go out of business. Let's get to know who the players are. And we just started meeting and the families, the bankers, the individuals, and very quickly we were we learned about Hapeg Lloyd. We learned about Zim. We learned about all these other companies by just putting the time and effort in. And we realized there are a lot of uh, families. And when you meet one, they're like, "Oh, you should meet that one. You should meet that one." If they if they believe in who you are and what you're trying to do, your network can help you build your network. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, I think we have maybe one or two more questions. Sure. Uh, one is um, he's asking about your thesis on Calumet. I believe that's how you say it, um, which it, he says is your biggest position. I don't know if that's true or not, but um, he's asking about your thesis on that. Sure. Company. It's Calumet, but Calumet. yes. Um, okay. Sorry. I'll keep it. Quick. No, it's, <laughs> some people have said it even crazier, but uh, uh, just at a very high level, uh, Calumet is uh, has a refining business. Uh, it's it's an MLP, so it's a it's a it's a uh, it's a partnership structure. It the Calumet's a company that kind of had a lot of operational issues over the years. Um, it had a very stretched balance sheet. We got involved because we thought uh, this was a situation where they were turning it, it around. They brought in manager that was cleaning it up, turning it around, refocusing the business. And the market just was so jaded to this company that it was trading at, at too low of a valuation. And ultimately, the real play here, it's it's we think that the really the current valuation justifies the businesses that they have today. What excites us about the tomorrow opportunity at Calumet is that they are evolving into a very large player in what's called renewable diesel. Uh, there's a huge market opportunity for renewable diesel businesses. Recently, you've seen Chevron acquiring or bidding for another company uh, in the in the space. There's a lot of consolidation and M&A going on. We don't think that the renewable diesel business is represented uh, enough in the current share price, if at all. And so without getting into the weeds here, it's our largest holding because A, it's worked. Uh, and so it grew to become the largest. We didn't start it there. And B, we think it remains a compelling situation with excellent leadership, wonderful assets, a cleaned up uh, balance sheet, cleaned up operational processes. It's, it's really in great shape, but it bears the legacy of the old perspective of the company. And slowly as the market understands, it's really a different 
uh, group today on the foundation of the old business. Uh, I think it, we think it'll continue to be revalued uh, very positively. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's going to be all we have time for today. But David, thank you so much. It's been an ab absolute pleasure to have you. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to um, prepare this presentation for us and share your thoughts on these uh, family-controlled companies, as well as answering our questions. Uh, if anybody missed anything, there's a full recap of this presentation, as well as uh, David's previous appearance on our on, here on YouTube, as well as on Guru Focus. That's all the time we have for today, so we do wish you the best of luck uh, in your current and future investments. See you all next time. Thank you very much.